Hi everyone, I'm Mara Webster with sag -AFTRA Foundation and thank you so much for tuning into another one of our conversations at home. As a continued reminder, we are continuing to raise funds for our COVID-19 Emergency Assistance Fund, which is working to support sag -AFTRA members who are currently out of work due to all of the closed film and television productions. So please check out the link below this video and consider supporting if you're able to in any way. Today we're incredibly fortunate to be joined by the wonderful Joanne Froggett, who is starring in the second season of Liar, which is currently airing on Sundance TV. Um, I wanted to just kind of start by asking you about how you're doing and, and how your day-to-day -day has been because obviously now we're about a month and a half into this lockdown and it looks like this is our new normal for a little bit longer than I think we all anticipated. Yeah it's um it's certainly been a strange strange time hasn't it um yeah I'm doing really well thanks it was uh like you know like everybody I found it to be a little bit of an adjustment to start with but I certainly sort of got myself into a sort of daily routine of doing a bit of exercise and you know getting some jobs done I'm, I'm keeping myself incredibly busy at the moment actually just sort of you know catching up with things and doing the things I never get time to do like sorting out my wardrobe and you know all those kind of things you think oh, I'll do that I'll do that one day so it's you know in some ways it's been nice to have the time to sort of just not be running around you know sort of ticking all the boxes but um but yeah, it's been incredibly challenging in so many different ways for so many different people. And it's just, um, yeah, it's just really heartbreaking when I see people going through so much pain and not being able to be with their loved ones. And, you know, when you see things on the news and so, um, yeah, it's a tricky old time, but I guess all we can do is keep positive and keep moving forward and get through it. Yeah, and I love the way that you've been using your voice and, and social media to really champion the NHS workers right now as well. That's been really wonderful to watch. Oh, thank you. Yeah, well, they're doing an incredible job. I'm just in absolute awe of them, as are all the healthcare professionals across the world and, you know, all our frontline workers in care homes and people delivering food to supermarkets and all of those people. But, you know, the NHS staff really are and, you know, care home workers really are putting their selves you know, at risk every day to keep us safe and to keep our loved ones safe. So yeah, my um my huge respect goes out to everybody working in that field across the world. Yeah, absolutely. And I wanted to to jump in and asking you about the TV show. And I have a genuine curiosity about when you first signed on to season one because you only had that first script and and obviously now at this point we know how it ends. We know that Laura was telling the truth from the beginning. Did you know that right when you were given the script when you considered signing on or was that still a little bit up in the air as to what you knew? Um, well, yeah, what, you, you're correct. When I read the, uh, when I was approached to do the first season, I only read episode one. So I met with our lead director, James Strong, in LA, actually, because we were both there at the time. And, um, and my first question was, who's telling the truth? Who's lying? Um, because I, I obviously needed to know that before I took the role on, because I, I as, a, as a person, I wouldn't have been able to take on the role if she was lying, because I would have felt it was a misrepresentative of, you know, our society. So I would have felt a, um, yeah, an, a need to, um, be true to my own belief system in, in that area. So, yeah, so that was my first question. But I read the first script and I thought, wow, this is really interesting because of how it's making me respond. Um, I didn't know who to believe. I didn't know whether to believe her or him, Laura or Andrew. And that really interested me because I I thought, wow, it's it's really twisting my thought process and it's really cleverly written and really cleverly done um not only is it you know a great piece of drama that's keeping me guessing um but it's also making me think on a on a on a higher level about my reaction to it as well so it just really struck a chord with me and um yes and luckily um the answer was that Laura was telling the truth so I could do the job without feeling without feeling that it was wrong in any way. <laughs> was, was there a difference in this season in how much you knew about her journey and the arc that she was going to go on because obviously the brothers who created the show knew that they were going to get the full season and, and that it was going to get made so I imagine that you had a bit more information to hand this time around. Yes, yeah, I had read an early draft of all six episodes for this second season. So I know, I knew, obviously I know now, I knew how, it, how it's concluded. Um, so, 
and it was again it was amazing because I, I remember reading through the episodes and not being able to put them down and then getting towards um getting into the final ep starting to read episode six and getting towards the end of episode six and just thinking oh, hang on a minute well is it is it that person or is it that person I'm really confused. and I was just I couldn't work it out and then and then I thought oh right okay da, da, da. and then and then there was a twist and then there was another twist and then I was like oh my goodness is that person and I was so shocked and it really really kept me guessing so that just filled me with so much joy because I just thought oh this is great if they can keep me guessing to that extent then you know I imagine most of our audience will be kept guessing as well which is which is what you want because you know it's a thriller it's it's supposed to keep you on the edge of your seat it's supposed to keep your mind tipping over you know obviously the theme is uh lies and lying and liars as the title would suggest and obviously the first season was you know who's telling the truth and who's lying between laura and andrew about what happened on that first date and the second season is you know who's lying about andrew's murder basically so the themes of the show carry on through but the you know the sort of outcome or the, the wanted outcome is different you know in season two um so yeah i just thought i thought jack and harry williams our writers had just done such a great job again at um you know keeping that memento momentum of the story going and um keep us all guessing so yeah i was really i was really proud yeah, Jack and Harry who created the show and then James Strong, he mentioned before as, as one of the main show directors. What was it about their approach that made you feel really safe that they were going to handle the subject matter incredibly sens sensitively? Because like it never sensationalizes or over dramatizes what it's dealing with. It really captures the real emotion of it. Yeah, so and I think that's an incredibly fine balance to hit, you know, when you're working with drama and a thriller genre as well to keep the emotional integrity of the story because it is an extremely sensitive subject matter and it needs to be treated as such and it needs needs to be treated with that level of respect um so i mean i'd worked with james strong our director before on downton and other things actually so i had complete faith in him um as a director i hadn't worked with jack and harry before but from early on um when i started to chat to them about the role and about the project they made it very very clear that this was this was never going to be about sensationalizing sexual assault it was never we were never going to show that sort of violence sexual violence against women on screen it was to do with um you know the story was was more based around how society sees these kind of incidents and through this thriller jack and harry found a way to sort of make us question ourselves because why don't we believe laura because she's not behaving like we feel a victim should behave or you know why do we believe andrew because he's a handsome successful um surgeon they're both successful people used to being um listened to used to being respected and when you're in that situation where there's just two people in a room how do you how do you find out the truth you know and they're tricky questions to ask and um but i think important questions to ask and so i just i knew from the off that jack and harry had done a lot of research um and their intentions were were aligned with mine from the start so i felt really comfortable being part of their team yeah, and I know that for the first season as well, and part of your own research on, on you know, the trauma and effect that this would, would have on someone that you were speaking to a counsellor as part of that process. And I was curious about what that research looked like this season and looking at where she would be in that journey of, of trauma and recovery at this, at this stage. Yeah, so obviously starting season one was a different uh, prospect in terms of looking at what research I needed to do to starting season two, because season one um obviously i i was playing laura before and after this terrible event in her life and before and after this trauma in her life so it was um i was trying to track that emotional journey for her as well um and track the effects of what's happened to her and how that develops over the course of the story and as the story develops um beginning season two 
she's already in the thick of it. We know she's been telling the truth all along. Um, and season two is very much sort of following on from where she is in season one, but she's just fighting still for justice and she's just really fighting to be believed and because season two starts um, exactly where we left off in season one but tells some of the, the story in uh, present day and some of the story in flashback so we go back over the last we flash back over the last three weeks while Andrew was on the run from the police before he was murdered uh, to find out what happened to him and you know the sort of conclusion of the story and um, so Laura is just getting into a more and more heightened place because she is still fighting for justice and she's still trying to fight her corner and she, Andrew still seems to be affecting her life adversely from beyond the grave so it's this incredible frustration and need to clear her name and um get some peace in her life you know to put this all to bed she just wants this to end so um yeah it was just sort of tapping into that anger and frustration and need to just keep fighting really I was also curious about even just the minutia of day-to-day -day coping mechanisms and the way that you thought about how that would just infiltrate into even just the smaller moments and especially her interpersonal relationships with her family and friends around her um so you mean in terms of the character in terms of Laura what I came up with for yeah and kind of like the way yeah. that you thought about interspersing that into your performance in the smaller moments as well you know I try and sort of pick that up just by feeling it in the scene really I just try and remember those little little nuances of emotion that she that, that Laura would be feeling for each person she's talking to whether that be frustration or love or anger or you know whatever the emotion be and I just try and sort of you know keep track of that and keep it keep it sort of active while I'm doing the scene really yeah and also I feel like we've got a lot more detail on her background and her family history and particularly her relationship with her father which which added a lot of depth and, and layers that we hadn't necessarily known about before was that kind of in line with what you had created for yourself in terms of the backstory did you find yourself having to pivot the idea that you'd come up with about what her backstory was a little bit um no it was pretty much in line with what I'd uh, come up with as a backstory or what we'd come up with as a backstory in for season one um, which was good. That's always helpful because sometimes um, you can be doing a job and then there's a, you know, there's a whole episode from your past and you're like, oh, okay, uh, that's a surprise. <laughs> Maybe I would have played this character slightly differently. <laughs> but I didn't have that with Laura, thank goodness. So I, yeah, that was, um, that was great. But again, I think that just comes down to um, Jack and Harry and, and James and, and Chris and, and myself and Joanne um, just all being on this very much on the same page about um, the um, you know about about the show as a whole and about the story as a whole and Jack and Harry were very collaborative so if there was ever anything that I felt I wanted to add or take away or change or you know and just make little sort of nuanced changes to script or whatever they were always really open to just sort of giving me and Yaran and, and James, our director, a bit of free reign with that, which was which was great because it just made it helped it feel really natural. Yeah. Did you have as much rehearsal time as you did for season one? Because obviously you're all coming back and knowing these characters a little bit better and knowing their interpersonal relationships with each other. And and if so, kind of what were the useful elements of discovery that came out of that time together before filming? Well, we had zero time together before filming on season two, unfortunately. We had zero rehearsal time. That was due to mine and Joanne's schedules. So Joanne was finishing off a show in Australia. Um, so he wasn't available for the first three weeks of the shoot. I was um, doing a play in London. I was the lead in a, in a play in London. So I finished the play, had one day off, and then I started filming the following day. So I, I had my final night on the, on the Saturday evening and I was filming Monday morning. So um, there was discussion about trying to do a read through and a rehearsal, you know, time, but um, it was sort of decided that um, instead of exhausting 
me on my final week of a play straight into an, another job. It was, uh, and because everybody, most people had been on the job before, um, we didn't get that sort of group rehearsal process. However, all the new actors that came in, who were all absolutely brilliant, they did have some rehearsal time with James and we did uh, pick some moments sort of during the shoot once we'd started to sort of sit down and go over scenes for that week or for the next day, we just sort of grabbed moments where we could. Um, so yeah, that's often the way it goes, I'm afraid, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and given the fact that you're dealing with so much emotional complexity and there's obviously a lot of quite difficult scenes to film, is there anything for yourself that you like to do on set to kind of get yourself in that headspace or, you know, kind of just taking yourself off to the side and, and what's, what's, what does your method look like right before you go into shooting those sorts of scenes? Yeah, it's, it's very much about concentration for me, really. Um, I always think of it a little bit when you, a little bit like meditating when you have to, uh, do emotional or very sort of heightened emotion sort of scenes, whether it be anger or upset. It's just about it's just about stopping for a second and just connecting with your emotions again. Because we spend all our time sort of rushing through life, and you know we sort of run around doing all our things we need to do. And as we know, sometimes it's when you lay down at night and try and go to sleep that your brain starts, or that you feel things that you weren't aware of during the day. So it's, for me, it's just very much about just taking a breath and stopping and sitting and finding that emotion in myself. Um, and I do that in different ways, depending on the day, depending on how easy or difficult I'm finding it to get, to get there on the day, because uh, every day is different. So sometimes I listen to music um, just because it helps me concentrate and like no one can talk to you then, because I'm, I'm always a bit over polite so if people talk to me I find <laughs> like I'm quite happy to say sorry guys I'm just taking a minute but it's hard when you overhear like someone having a laugh and a joke and you and you find something funny and you know it's sort of over in your peripheral vision it's quite difficult to block that out while you can still hear it so sometimes listening to music just helps me take myself away and, and sort of take myself out of what's happening around me um, and just sort of help center me and helps me concentrate really um and then yeah it's just about i think just sometimes having a bit of a bit of quiet before the scene starts and you know our crew and cast are incredibly respectful of that and um it's about being respectful of each other's um process as well so some people can have a laugh and a joke and then turn it on like that some people like me actually just need a few minutes to just sit and concentrate and often if i've got big scenes to do they'll be in the back of my mind all day. So my mind will be sort of thinking about them all day and it'll be sort of hanging over me. And then it's almost like a release to be able to do it sometimes. Um, so yeah, that's it. <laughs> and you've mentioned in the past that it's always been important for you to really be able to leave the work behind at the end of the day and to really separate from your character. And I was, I was curious if that's always been part of your process or if that was something that you developed along the way and kind of figured out works best for you through trying different methods. Yeah, it, I definitely figured that out along the way. I basically, you know, it's difficult because sometimes when you're, especially when you're playing the lead in something, whether it be a play or a film or a TV show, you are pretending to be that character or thinking about that character or thinking about that character's behavior for most of your waking hours you know so you you are affected by it um and i often dream about work and you know things like that but i think we all do that because like i say we're spending a lot of our time of our waking moments thinking about it but i do think it's also important for me I've learned to put the character to bed at least at the end of the week so I often sort of you know just on a Friday night or the last night of the shoot of the, of the week I just kind of usually just have a release of like oh right okay I'm me again great and then hopefully if you have two days off have a day off and then have a day learning lines for the following week so um but yeah I try to just sort of when I leave Set. when I get in the car to leave set I try and just leave that character behind as well each day so some days yeah. easier than others but <laughs> and obviously with the first season of Liar it's very much kind of a two-hander and this season feels like it's so much more from your character's perspective and 
even just camera shots, there's so many times where it really just lingers on Laura and the other characters are still just have their back or they're just kind of a shadow in the, in the corner of the shot. And, and I was curious if that made you think about your performance in a different way, in the way that the camera was really just following your journey in a more intense way. No, not at all, actually, um, because I try and not to think too much of doing in terms in, it's important to know what the camera is doing technically, yeah. as in sometimes, you know, if you're on a big wide shot and you've got to do a take where you've got to do a scene that's very emotional um, and you've also got another five emotional scenes to do that day, there's no point giving everything on the big wide because no one can really see your face. So it's just in terms of practicality, sometimes, you know, knowing, um, you know, how, how big the shot is, is sometimes helpful. Um, however, I try and ignore the camera, but I have this sort of, um, I, I feel like there's like a second part of my brain that is very aware of the technicality of what's happening and where I need to be and what mark I need to hit. We didn't really use marks in Liar very much. It was quite a fluid way to shoot, which was great. But um, you do become very close to your camera team when you're the lead and you're spending a lot of time together because, you know, it is like a dance sometimes, especially when it is quite a fluid um, sort of camera movement. And a lot of Liar was done, filmed hand handheld. And so you do learn to sort of move with the team, but also at the same time, forget the camera's there. It's it's a strange it's a strange mix of things that your brain sort of eventually naturally does. It becomes second nature, I guess. I guess it's like when you're driving. You know, when you first start driving, you're very aware of everything and what you're doing. Um, but when you've been doing it for years, you can drive from A to B, and you know, you just do it. And I think um, it becomes like that with being on set. The more you do it, the technicality become second nature and then you're sort of free to just let your mind get into what you're doing and you know building your character which is obviously my part of the job. <laughs> I just wanted to ask you a little bit about the wider conversations that have happened around the show because obviously you know even just particularly in the entertainment industry and industries as a whole the conversations that we're having about sexual violence and, and consent have changed drastically in the last couple of years since season one and and I imagine that you've had a huge response from women and, and you know, a lot of people reaching out to you and connecting to you differently in terms of this character and, and the journey that she goes on. Does that play into the way that you think differently about the work that you're doing and especially the, the importance and power that storytelling like this can have? Yeah, absolutely. It's been a very interesting period of time between seasons of Liar, uh, as if you, you know, if we're just using that as a marker. Um, season one aired in the UK, um, and I think it was about, I think we were about halfway through season one airing when everything started to hit about Harvey Weinstein and um, all of that. And that's, you know, so season one came out before the Me Too movement. Um, obviously there's been huge conversations globally about sexual assault, about abuse of power, um, which I think are hugely, have been Im imperative and just hugely important. Um, you know, abuse of power is not okay in any in any situation, and um, yeah, it was interesting that that Liar hit at a time when um, you know the world started talking about these things. Because I remember doing press for the first season of Liar, and journalists sometimes asking me, you know, how did I feel about um, a thriller being based around sexual the subject of sexual assault, and is that you know, appropriate, and I, my answer was, well, yes, because we accept police shows and thrillers and whether they be movies or TV about terrible situations all the time, about murders and child abduction and even paedophilia. So why is sexual assault, why does sexual assault still feel like a taboo subject? Mm -hmm. And therefore, I think it's really important to be doing drama um, based around all sorts of subjects that aren't necessarily you know widely spoken about in you know sort of comfortable conversation so um yeah and and it's it's changed a huge amount moving into season two which is incredible because i didn't get asked any of those questions when i was doing the press for season two um you know we 
as a society have really begun to change opinion and really begun to educate to educate ourselves and our younger people and older people on what is acceptable behavior and what isn't acceptable behavior um and i think that is just a a brilliant thing and i'm you know i'm glad liar has been a small part of that conversation definitely yeah and in terms of your your own voice in the industry and your own ability to kind of bring forth stories i wanted to ask you about your production company that you started run after it and and kind of what feels important to you in the types of stories that you really want to tell and the voices that you want to elevate through producing as well as acting well i'm very drawn to stories that are great entertainment but have something intelligent to say behind it so i'm always drawn to scripts like say liar or you know all sorts of different shows that I've done that are either just fascinating stories to me that sort of investigate human behavior in some way um or just just sort of touch on things that or subject matters that make us sort of question our belief system or question you know our thought process about certain subjects and I do think you know, it's important to remember that drama is pretend and, you know, we're not saving lives and it's, it is entertainment. But I do think it has a great power to open up story and, and to people and give people an opportunity to empathise with, with characters and situations that they may never have come across in their own life. And I think that's a really powerful, interesting interesting tool to be you know to be to have at your fingertips in some ways and also you you know I think you have to deal with it in a responsible way as well yeah well thank you so much for taking the time to talk about the tv show and, and all of this it's been really wonderful and I hope that you and your family all stay safe thank you likewise stay safe thank you for having me